Today, we do something that we haven't done in a while, which is calculus. We use the word derivatives. It's like, wow, I kind of forgot that this is a calculus class because we've been doing so much geometry. But uh, yeah, it was, it was bound to happen sooner or later. So to get there, we're going to start talking about a particular setting. So we're going to work in what are called parametric curves. Now you might remember these from calculus two because we talked about parametric curves in two dimensions. Now we're going to parametric curves in three dimensions, but the ideas are essentially the same. So what is a parametric curve? Well, the idea is think of it like there's a particle moving through space. So this is moving around. We can just draw a random particle. Maybe it, it sneaks behind the z-axis wraps around, and keeps going. Okay, so here is our particle traveling, and we'll add a little arrow here to indicate it's moving in that way. Now at a particular moment in time, I can say, look, where are you? Well, the answer is it's in some position in space, and so we'll say it's at the position x of t, y of t, z of t. In other words, if I want to know where I am, you give me a time t, and I'll tell you exactly each one of the coordinates I've now located where I'm at. So this is great. This is wonderful. This is intuitive. And these are what we call parametric curves. So when we talk about the word parametric curve, we're talking about this type of setup, x of t, y of t, z of t, as a point. Now there is a, a drawback to parametric curves when it comes to doing calculus, in that points aren't good to work with. You can't add points, you can't scale points. These are not things that we can do. So we say, aha, I want to get something like a point, but it's something where I can talk about addition, I can talk about differences, I can talk about scaling. And so we have this great idea that says, you see these rounded braces here for the points, we're going to make them pointy and thus turn it into a vector-valued function. So instead of having it as a point, think of it as a vector. And the way you can think of it is the following. In particular, you can say, look, I'm going to make it so I just nail down one end of my vector at the origin. So it's, vectors can be moved. And it's still the same vector. But now we're saying, no, no, put it so that you start at the origin. So what's happening is as t changes, the vector points to your particular location. So if the vector follows along what the curve does. So you get a vector valued function, x of t, y of t, z of t, and now we're ready to cook. Because if we want to do calculus, two important things you have to be able to do to do calculus, you have to be able to add, and you have to be able to scale. And if you can do those two things, you can do calculus. And we'll, we'll talk about why we say that in a little bit, in a few minutes. But first, if we're going to do calculus, we have to go back and visit the, the hits, the golden oldies. So let's start with limits. All right. Well, what are limits? There's a lot of ways to think about limits, but here's how I like to think about limits. Namely, limits are telling us what should happen as we get close. So there's some sort of phenomenon that prevents us from actually saying, what's happening at this location? Maybe there's some ambiguity. Maybe something's not well defined. You say, so I, I can't actually go visit that location and tell you the answer. So we'll settle for the second best thing, which is say, OK, if I can't actually see what's happening at it, what's happening as I get close to it? And in particular, what should happen if I were to able to go all the way in? So that's what the limits are telling us, what should happen, based on what happens nearby. Now, at the heart, we have sort of two phenomena. There's the, what happens as we get close? Well, th there's the input is getting close, and then there's the output is getting close. So if you go back to the old definition of a limit, and you say, well, okay, stop waving your hands, What's the old definition? It's, it's this definition. It says, my limit as I approach some value of c of f of t equals l. So a scalar value function, this is just the nice functions that you're used to. It says, look, 
as I get close to C, the function gets close to L, well, I need to have two notions of close, because there's the T is getting close to C and the F of T getting close to L. So that's these epsilons and deltas. Epsilons and deltas are saying, what does it mean to be close? Well, it says, if my input is close, so that's the zero less than delta, and in particular, close enough based on epsilon, then my output is very close. Okay, that's the old definition. What's the new definition? A vector valued function, well, we're going to change it subtly. In fact, at first you might not even think there's been any change at all, because it looks basically the same. And it should, because the same ideas are in play. What's our big change? Well, notice that little f has become a bolded capital F. This is some of our notation. If oftentimes when we want to represent a vector value function, we use a bold, bold uh, letter. So whenever you see bold, think vector. Vectors are bold. Ugh. All right. So I have a vector valued function, and I say it's getting close to a vector L. And then you say, OK, it looks the same. So epsilon deltas are still measures of closeness. My input is still close, and the only thing that changes is that the output is still close. But now, instead of using absolute value, I'm just using magnitude. But remember, absolute value and magnitude are really the same thing. They're saying, how big are you? And that's a measure of distance. So that's why the absolute value and our magnitude use the same symbols, because it's measuring the same type of thing. Now, I should pause and say, we will never test you directly on the limit definition. So there's never going to play the fun, I give you an epsilon, you give me a delta game, which uh, is a, always a popular one at parties. But the intuition is the important thing. We're here, we're working on the intuition. The intuition says, look, things work the same way. So we're talking about things should be close. All right, so here, if things are working the same way, how do I know if I'm close to a particular vector? What needs to be true? Now, if I'm close to a number, I just need to say, look, my distance from that number is, is small. But vectors, remember, they have components. So how am I close to a particular vector? Well, not a big surprise. And you're going to see this theme again and again. We're close as long as we're close in every entry. So what I mean by that is if you think about it as a vector in component form, you have this x of t, y of t, c of t. I'm close if I'm close in every single entry. In fact, that's an if and only if. If I am very close in each entry, then I'm pretty close. And if there's any entry where I'm not close, I'm not close. So it just sort of says, hey, closeness becomes entry-wise. And now, spoiler alert for the rest of today's lecture and next lecture and probably a chunk of the lectures after that, is if you want to do something, work entry by entry. And that's how it all unfolds. So in other words, it, it's sort of intuitive. So for instance, suppose I want to find the following. I want to find the limit as t goes to 0 of t squared minus 1, e to the t, and sine t over t. So in other words, I have this, this vector valued function. And I can think of it as in the same way I can say, well, look, this really represents a curve in space. Where if I just say, instead of the vector, think of it as a point. We will swap back and forth and to the point where, even though we have vectors, we'll think about them as representing positions. So, but that's just a convention. It's easy for us to change our round, nice points to those sharp vector points, vector. All right, so how do we do this type of problem? Well, the point is, work entry by entry. So instead of saying, how do I figure out what's happening? I say, well, this is really the same as the limit as t goes to 0 of t squared minus 1 comma, limit t goes to 0, e to the t, and comma, limit as t goes to 0, sine t over t. So in other words, 
what happens in each one of the entries. If I can figure that out, I'm great. Life's good. So let's talk about each one. What happens to t squared minus 1 as t goes to 0? Negative 1. Not a big surprise. What happens to e to the t as t goes to 0? Goes to 1, because you can just plug in 0. What happens to sine t over t as t goes to 0? Goes to 1. Now you might say, how do we know that? Well, one thing we can say is uh, we learned it in Calc 1. And it was so amazing to us. It's just, it's, it's on our hearts. It just, it's right there. Or you could say, I, I did L'Hopital's rule. Oh, now you might say, oh, L'Hopital, what a great rule. Well, there's some bad news coming in a few weeks, but we'll wait till after the next exam to tell you that. Okay, and that's it, that's it. So again, work entry-wise, entry by entry. Well, that's limits. So now we have limits. So what comes after limits? If we keep going down our calculus path, what's the next natural step? Derivatives. Okay. So, how do we do derivatives? Well, suppose I have a vector valued function. So I have this vector valued function. Again, I'm using the bold f to represent a vector valued function and has individual entries are their own, own functions. On a side note here, we're going to spend most of the time in, in dimension 3. 90% of what we talk about works for any dimension. There's something that won't, but we're not there yet. So if I want to take the, the derivative, I just say, well, what does the derivative represent? Well, I can throw it right into the definition. So f prime of t, it's the limit as something, I'll call it b. b goes to 0 f of t plus b minus f of t over b. That's just the definition of the derivative. All I've done is I've put in a, that, that vector value function into it. Now, I said a few minutes ago that uh, when we think about derivatives, what do we need? We need the ability to add and to scale. If you look at that definition, that's what you're doing. You're doing two operations. You're adding and you're scaling. And then after you do that, you take a derivative. Now, do you see where the add comes from? Where are we adding two vectors? Yeah. See, really, subtraction is really just addition in disguise. This is where I'm adding vectors together. So that's why you need to be able to add something in order to do calculus. Where's the scale? I said th that we also need to be able to scale. Where is that? Divided by b? Yeah, it turns out this divide by b, you can think of it as 1 over b times something. So you could rewrite this expression in the following way, where essentially what you're doing is you're taking addition. Again, I think of subtraction as a form of addition. And then I'm scaling it. So that's why you need to be able to add and to scale. And once you have that, you can talk about a derivative. All right, well, now we just sort of follow the definition. I have f of t. I can figure out what f of t plus b is. And I just simplify and I say, well, what does it look like entry by entry? All right, so, so this just says start with this f of t plus b minus f of t over b and work it out. And that's what you get. So other than a lot of, of writing, it's nothing surprising. So what you expect to happen in each entry is what happens in each entry. And now, what's the idea with our limits? From the previous slide. We do it entry-wise. So instead of thinking as one limit, we do three. So this is sort of like the fun thing about vector-valued functions. It, it lets us do triple the amount of work for one problem. You know, one for each entry. Ah, good. Now we stare at these and say, hey, things are looking familiar. 
So this f of t plus b minus f of t over b, what does that look like? Especially when I throw in this limit. It's a derivative. What derivative do I see in the first entry? Derivative of, of f. So that's f prime. The second entry? g prime. Third entry? h prime. And that's exactly what it is. So, moral of the story. If I want to take the derivative of a vector valued function, one entry at a time. Done. Done. Okay, so let's actually do it. So we need a, a function, hopefully a not unpleasant one, but let's try it. So give me some functions. What should we put into our first slot? What? Well, someone said e to the x, someone said t. Well, certainly everything needs to be the function of t because of the t. So e to the t, we can put in some more in the first slot. Hopefully not too much more. Sine t. Sine t. All right. Comma. All right, next slot. x cubed minus x squared. Right, but remember, we need t. Ah. t. So it could be t cubed minus t squared plus 137. Four arctangent of t. Four arctangent of t. Someone has taken my class before. <laughs> okay, good. All wonderful choices. So, I'm looking for f prime of t. And the moral is, we just work it entry by entry. Derivative of e to the t plus sine t, e to t plus cosine t, good. You still remember, derivative of t cubed minus t squared plus 137. 3 t squared minus 2 t. The 137 goes away. One semester, I used 137 a lot. And the students soon realized, whenever they saw the number 137, it was a secret code for like, this disappears. But then you have to figure out, but why? That's, a, that's the fun part. Okay. Comma. Wait, but it can't be y. This expression is based on the variable t. Ah, that's. Oh, 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 man. Ouch. Okay, so, derivative of 4 arctangent t. It has a 4 in the answer if that helps. 4 over 1 plus t squared. Okay. All right. So again, it's just entry by entry, no surprises, no surprises. Well, um, yeah, so derivatives work entry-wise, as we've already observed. And so the nice thing is that when it comes to rules for derivatives, everything that you think should be true basically is true. And for the obvious reasons, and when I say the obvious reasons, I mean that because we're doing it everything entry-wise. So what are some things we think should be true? Well, one thing we think should be true is that if I want to take the derivative of where I'm adding two vector value functions, I just take the derivative of each individual one and add them together. True. Still true. <coughs> Something else, the chain rule. Now here we have to be a little bit careful. What is the chain rule look like? So I have a function, a function. Now, the outside function is a vector value function. In other words, capital F is a vector. The inside function is what we call a scalar valued function, which is just another way of saying the output is a number. So I, I, it's, a, it's a type of function that we've been working with in the past. So if I look at this composition, it does make sense. Now, we will at one point in the semester start getting to the point where we talk about vector valued functions where the vector is the input, but that's towards the very end of the semester, and those will be some happy times. So when I have the derivative of f of g of t, well, the way I do it is I take the derivative of the outside, the vector valued function, plug in g of t, and then I multiply that by g prime of t. Now, when I say I multiply here, this is really a, a type of product. This is a scalar product of, 
And what I mean by that is it's a scalar vector product. So I'm scaling a vector. Normally we put the scaling term in front, but it doesn't matter whether we put it in the front or put it at the end. So how, how would you prove? Let's prove the chain rule, because I think the chain rule probably is a, a reasonable thing to prove. So suppose I say that capital F of t is the vector x of t, y of t, z of t. Again, it doesn't have to be three dimensions, but, but three dimensions is a very uh, good place to start. So if I'm looking at the derivative of capital F of g of t, well, that would be the derivative of, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite f of g of t, and I'm going to say, well, that's what f is, but I'm plugging in g of t. So it's a vector valued function. What's the first entry? <coughs> it would be x of g of t. So if you think about it, because here it says, if I have a t, I'm putting t into each individual piece here. And I'm replacing it now by g of t. So everywhere I saw a t before, I'm putting g of t. So x of g of t, comma, y of g of t, and I think I'm just about off the page, so I'm going to move things over, comma, z of g of t. Okay, so that's the derivative that we're after. Well, now we say, hey, the derivatives work entry-wise, because that's what we just proved. So this is the derivative of x of g of t, comma, the derivative of y of g of t, comma, and the derivative of z of g of t. There we go. So, so far, we really haven't done much. We've just said, what's the function? Let's make the observation that things work entry-wise. Now, when I take the derivative of x of g of t, what can I use? Yeah. See, the whole point is these properties translate over because they are actually the properties from calculus because I work entry-wise. Because it holds for each entry. So it's x prime g of t times g prime of t. I apply the chain rule for the first entry. And I do it all the way through. y prime of g of t, g prime of t, and z prime of g of t times g prime of t. Now comes the, the great aha. And the great aha is to say they all have something in common. They all have g prime of t in common. So whenever I see a common thing in each of my, my slots, each of my entries, I can say, let me pull it out. So I can pull it out, and I could pull it out in front, or I could pull it out in back. In this case, it becomes a little bit more convenient to pull it on the back side. So my x prime g of t, y prime g of t, z prime g of t, and then I'm pulling out the common term, which is acting like a scaling term, g prime of t. And then the last thing to observe is that this part right here is the same thing I would have gone if I plugged g of t into f prime. And that's it. That's the proof. So the proof for the, the chain rule here follows from what happened in our old single variable calculus. All right. And everything else, by the way, that we talk about follows the same, same way. OK, so sum rule, chain rule, what comes next? Product rule. Right. We're going to talk product rule. Now you might think, okay, well, how many product rules will there be, by the way? Just one. It's the same rule. Will there just be one? It turns out there will be more than one. We're going to have product rules. And you might say, why do we have product rules? Well, because we're going to have a product rule for each different one of our vector products. Do you remember how many vector products we have? It rhymes with glee. 
There's three, that is correct. Now, in case you can't remember, there's the scalar product, which means I'm going to scale my vector. So it's a number times a vector. I'm just making my vector larger or smaller. That's one product. The next one is dot product. Vector dot a vector, I get a number, and that number has some interesting geometrical meaning, and there's a cosine involved. The last one is cross product, and that's kind of weird. Okay, so let's think about what they would be. Let's start with the simple one. So if you do a, a scalar product, not a big surprise. So here, again, I'm thinking of f as a scalar. So it's a number, g as a vector. And it says if I want to take the derivative, well, derivative of the scalar function times the vector function plus the vector function times the derivative, plus the scalar function times the derivative of the vector function. So in other words, what you would expect. But that's not so, so unusual. Next one is the dot product. And the dot product, if you think about it, the dot product really, uh, if you apply a dot product to a vector, you get back to just something without a vector. So it's no surprise that the old thing carries over. Because once you're, you're in a dot product, you're like, look, really the dot product is just a scalar function now, once you actually evaluate. So everything should translate, and it does. Now, th there's things to check, but it doesn't take long, and it, it's not exciting, so we'll skip the checking. But, but it works. But the cross product. Now that's strange. So that one you have to be a little bit careful of. And so the cross product is actually exactly what you think it should be. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, what do you do to, to verify the cross product? Well, lots and lots of checking. Or like I like to say, it's a calculus one miracle. But lo and behold, all these products work exactly like you think they should work, which is wonderful. That's what you want. You want things to work out nicely. Now, there's one thing we didn't put here, the sum rule, the chain rule, the product rule. Sort of the next thing is the quotient rule. We don't talk about the quotient rule because we don't have a way to divide vectors. Now, we could divide a vector by a scalar, but that, since, that just gets us back to a product rule. Vectors are not the same as numbers. So, you, so yes, we can add and multiply and divide but for, for numbers, but you can't do those for vectors. So those are our, our rules, and these are useful to know. In fact, one of my favorite problems on next week's quiz is that. But that's a, that's a different story. Okay, so we've taken limits. We've talked about derivatives. So the next step in our calculus journey, tangent lines. Well, that seems like a good place to go after you've talked about derivatives. So what's a tangent line? What do we mean? Well, so again, I have some curve that's traveling through space, doing something, and I might say, well, suppose I want to know what's happening at a particular time. So I'm fixing a particular location. So I'm, I want to know what's happening right there. What's going on at that particular spot? Well, the same philosophy applies. Now, what's the philosophy? It says, zoom in. So, you know, if you had your phone, you do your pinch zoom, but you keep zooming and zooming in. And if you zoom in and you look close, you'll see, aha, it looks pretty flat. So our curves, we still have the same notion of locally it looks flat. So locally, it should look like a flat thing, which we'll call this the tangent line. Now, the question is, how do we find a tangent line? So let's think about it. What information do we need to get a line? We need two pieces of information. Point and... and in calc 1, we would have said slope, but now we're in multivariable calc, so we don't say slope, we say direction, which is a vector. Okay. 
So, now, what's our, our point? Well, our point is given by the parametric curve. So in other words, I have this parametric curve. I'm going to think of it as in terms of a vector valued function. And I'm going to store it, you know, x, t, y, t, z of t. So I know my point at any given moment of time. That's r of t. So now the question is, what's the direction? Well, any guesses? Or maybe not even a guess? Where do you think it should be? What? Prime. Yeah, it's our prime. Exactly like you would think. Because what's happening? Well, if you think about what's happening, uh, I, can, I can try to sketch a bad picture. I'm pretty good at drawing bad pictures. So locally, again, we've zoomed in. So again, just emphasize, this is the zoomed in part. And I'm not drawing just a, a straight thing because I'm not able to draw. I'm drawing a straight thing because I've zoomed in. So when I think about the derivative, the derivative says, look at my point at r of t, and then just move just a little bit r of t plus h. Because the t tells me how you move along the curve. So if this is r of t, r of t plus h says, oh, you just move forward in time a little bit. Now you're at a new location. So when I'm talking about the direction of the derivative, it involves taking the difference of these two. So the direction is that direction. Now, when I say it's, it's the difference between these two, there's one other thing. What happens? Do you remember? Something with magnitude? It is indeed something with magnitude. So if you look at the definition of the derivative, it's r of t plus h minus r of t, which is this vector, but then there's you divide by h. Because you might say, oh, if r of t plus h, h goes to zero, that goes to like the zero vector. No, no, no. We're, this is not art history. There's a point here. There's, there's definitely something going on. So when we, we scale, the, 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 plus, the division by h makes sure we scale it the right way, to the proper size, proper magnitude. So the point being, though, it does point along where the curve is going. So lo and behold, this derivative is going in the direction locally that the curve is doing. So that's why the derivative captures the direction of the tangent line. OK. So let's find a tangent line to the parametric curve. And we'll do it at t equals 0. OK, so I need some functions. Negative e to the 3t? OK, that's a function. All right, next slot. 4 sine of 2t. 4 sine of 2t. Works for me. All right, one more to go. T. Just T? Yeah. Why not? It's a you're right, you're right. It's just a function. T. Okay, here we go. All right, so I want to find the tangent line to the parametric curve R of T given by negative E to the 3T, 4 sine 2T, comma T at T equals 0. So again, we, we say we approach this like we, we would any problem. We say, well, I'm looking for a line. Looking for a line? Think pointing vector. What's the point? Plug in zero. Yeah, plug in zero. So the point, if I actually represent it as a point, or represent it as a vector, we would be forgiving. We would accept either. Because Honestly, when we're doing the work, that's how we work. OK, so plug in 0, what do you get? Negative 1? 0, 0. So negative 1, 0, 0. OK, that's all right. That's a good point. Now, next up is direction vector. 
I need my vector. Well, that's probably going to be a little bit harder, but I know the right vector is to take the derivative. So we're going to come down and, and do the r prime of t. So, throw to the first slot. Negative 3 e to the 3t. Throw to the second slot. 8 cosine of 2t. 8 cosine of 2t. And last but not least, the derivative of t, 1. Okay, now what happens? Plug 0 into the derivative? Yeah, we plug 0 into the derivative. Now, notice this vector valued function is actually a, a, a function. And it, it, what it tells us is it tells us what's the direction vector at any given time. It's once we evaluate it that we do have our direction vector for our tangent line. So it's important to remember to evaluate. So when we evaluate, what vector do we end up with? Negative 3, 8, 1. Alright, so I have the point, I have the vector, put them together, and you get a line. So x equals, y equals, z equals, and I like to do it in parametric form. Now, now you see why we're calling it parametric form, by the way. Uh, point negative 1, 0, 0, so I just put it in, negative 1, 0, 0, just read it straight down, and then the vector, negative 3, 8, 1, so it's minus 3t, plus 8t, plus t, one, 1 times t. There's an there's a unwritten 1 there. Now it's written, so it's no longer unwritten. Okay, which of course you can clean that up. x equals negative 1 minus 3t, y equals 8t, and z equals t. Alright, so that's not so bad. We should have more of those. Well, now let's ask another question. For the same parametric curve as in the previous example, and here's the previous example, find the plane which is perpendicular to the parametric curve at time t equals zero. So, I'm not looking for a line. I'm looking for a plane. Now, when I was looking for a line, I needed a point and a vector. I'm looking for a plane now. So now I need a a point and a vector. But now it's the vector is a normal vector. Well, okay, so it's the same curve and I want it to be perpendicular. And what does that mean? Well, suppose I come back to this for a second here. What that means is if we zoom in, because again, I only care about what happens when I zoom in, so I'm zoomed in again. I spend a lot of time zooming in. I have this particular time, and I want to find the plane such that if I look at the curve zoomed in, it would be slicing through the plane at a right angle. That's what I'm after. I want to find the, the plane where the curve would pass through at a right angle. Not the wrong angle. It's got to be right, the right angle. Okay? I'm piercing that, that plane. So, let's think about it. Which point do I need? It's the same point. See, because I want it to be perpendicular at this time zero. So I want it to be at the same point, so that I'm hitting at the right point. It's not just a matter of being at the right sort of tilt. So you can think of your plane as being somehow tilted. No, no. I need to be at the right location as well. So the point, still the same point. Negative 1, 0, 0. So there's our point. Now, what about the normal vector? What's the right vector to choose? Well, what's the right vector? I want it to be normal, so I want it to be that way. Which one do we pick? R prime. Yeah, it's still R prime. In essence, what happens is that the line that we just found is perpendicular to the plane that we want to find. So our, our normal vector is going to be the vector negative 3, 8, 1. Okay, so 
we have our point and we have our normal vector, we put them together and great things should happen. Well, so if I want a plane, what I do is I read off these coefficients. These coefficients are going to fall in and give me the coefficients of x, y, and z. So the negative 3, 8, 1 coming from the normal vector, those are the coefficients of x, y, z. Equals something. Now, this is the what's in the box type moment. Because the question is, what's in the box? Well, we've already used as much as we can of our normal vector. What haven't we used yet? We haven't used the point. So the question is, how do we use the point to fill in the box? Well, it is like the dot product, but uh, using what we have on the screen currently. This point has to be on the plane. So what you can do is you can say, look, plug the point in and see what happens. So to find out what goes here is plug the point into the other side. So if I have negative 3 times negative 1 plus 8 times 0 plus 1 times 0, what will I end up with? I'll end up with 3. You happen to give me a point with lots of zeros. That's a thank you for doing that. And so we have this plane, negative 3x plus 8y plus z equals 3, and that is the answer. All right, so we can find tangent lines, and we can find perpendicular planes. All right. Now, here's something else. Suppose I have something, a curve, with constant magnitude. So in other words, if I look at the magnitude of R of t, it never changes. We're going to show that R and its derivative are perpendicular. And the amazing thing is, we have almost nothing about R. R could be a really wacky function. So, this will be fun. So let's think about some things which are true. First off, we know that the magnitude is constant. So if I think of the magnitude of R of t, that's something which is constant. Well, do constant functions have any nice properties? It's a good question. We'll come back to that. There's something else. R of t and R prime of t are perpendicular. How do you check to see if two things are perpendicular? Dot product. Dot product. So this is a constant. And somehow we want to get to the punchline. So in particular, dot product says two things perpendicular only if their dot product is zero. So we want to get from this fact to that fact. OK. Well, first thing I notice is that this does have an r of t, but I need an r prime. So it means I need at some point to say a derivative. I also notice that this is a 0. And then I started thinking to myself, I just said the word derivative, and I see the word constant. If I mix those two together, what's true about the derivative of a constant? Zero. Zero. Very suspicious. OK, so I'm going to use this fact. 0 is the derivative of a constant. So I'm going to say that 0 is the derivative of the magnitude of r of t. But then I say, huh, wait a second. I seem to recall something about dot products and magnitudes. What's true about dot products and magnitudes? Well, if you take r of t dot r of t, what do you end up with? magnitude of r of t squared. So I'm actually going to cheat a little bit and put a square there. I can because I left myself some space. I anticipated I would want that space. Well, so this is the derivative of r of t dot r of t.
Hmm. Is there any rule that lets us take the derivative of r of t dot r of t? Perhaps a rule that we've talked about earlier today. The product rule. And the product rule for dot product says the right thing is the obvious thing. Okay, so we take derivative of the first, dot the second, plus the first, dot the derivative of the second. Now, when it comes to dot product, it doesn't matter what order you take a dot product, and that's a nice feature of dot products. So I can say that this is equal to twice r of t dot r prime of t. And remember that this was equal to zero. So we have that r of t dot r prime of t is zero, meaning that these two vectors are indeed perpendicular. Okay, well, do we care about this? And the answer is we actually will, because we are going to use this fact. And you might say, but does this ever apply? If magnitude of R of t is constant, doesn't that mean that it's just not changing? What's the answer to that question? Well, the answer is no, because you might live on something that looks like a ball. And if you live on something that looks like a ball, it's quite possible that you can spend your time moving around on this ball. And if you say, look, the center of your ball is zero, even if you move, your magnitude stays the same. So just because your magnitude is constant doesn't mean that you are. And that's it for today. See you next time.